Good morning. Thanks for joining us online today. I'm Pastor Mike, and I take care of the worship at Faith. At Faith, we are all about loving people, lifting them, and launching them into purpose. And we are so excited that you joined us online today. We've got a fun time of worship planned and a great time of digging into the Word. And we also want to pray with you. If you need prayer for anything or you know someone who needs prayer, please don't hesitate to call into the church. The numbers will be on the screen so you can call in and receive prayer for any of your needs. Also, make sure to leave a comment just to say hi or say great word pastor or something like that, especially if you're joining us for the first time. We definitely want to hear from you and find out who you are and just love you and lift you and launch you. And we just want to tell you have a great morning and thanks so much for joining us.
Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us in person or online. If we could stand up, we're going to praise Jesus. Yeah, we're not supposed to be singing in this house, but God is still good and he's still going to be praised. Second Corinthians says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And this song speaks about that. It says, in your presence, there is freedom. So he is all the freedom we need. Even if we're told not to sing, he'll be praised. Let's praise him.
which has remained in his presence. We're gonna we're gonna do a new song now about God of revival. And just as we sing the words, just the song is a prayer and it's a it's a declaration, just crying out to God for revival in our city and in our lives. So just pray the words with us as we sing them. Let them sink into your heart and just declare them.
pretty well known and I've heard it a lot, even in this time of self-isolation and when the pandemic started. But it is a promise of God where God says, if you do this, then I will respond by doing this. And so as we just continue to set our hearts and our minds on things above in worship, I'm just going to read this passage of scripture, but I'm going to do it in segments because you can repeat after me. And for those of you at home, just repeat after me as we make this declaration. It's a promise from God. So I'll read the first part and then I'll pause as you repeat it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. And so we understand when it comes to things that God is not a formula, but this is a promise. And God is not talking to people who aren't in a relationship with him. He's talking to people who are in a relationship with him. That's why he starts by saying, if my people who are called by my name would follow through and do these things, humble themselves, pray, seek his face, then in response, God would say, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and will heal their land. And this is basically what we've been singing about, that God, you would touch this land once again, that you would bring revival to this place. But it starts here in this place of prayer where we acknowledge it's not about us, it's about acknowledging our need for God to step in and to intervene. So just as worship continues, I just want to encourage you to again, set your hearts, your minds on things above. And in humility, where you say, it's not about me, it's all about you, God. We are desperate for you. We recognize our need of you. And so as we do that, and God says, I will hear. I will hear. And then he will respond. Let's just continue to worship the Lord. Death is overcome, you've already won. 
death is overcome. You already won. God of revival. Worship to 
30 seconds, but he's worthy of it. So, thank you so much for worshiping with us. We're going to have some announcements now. Good morning and welcome to Faith Welland. If you're joining us for the first time, we actually have something for you. Simply grab a Connect card located in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and exchange it at the end of the service for a small gift. Just our way of saying welcome. VBS is still happening this year. We've changed the date in order to make sure we provide you with a wonderful virtual camp experience. Mark down August 17th through 21st for our Rocky Railway Adventure. Each child will be receiving an individual pack with supplies and snacks. Registration forms will be available at faithwelland.com. Our sign up for you to be a part of the in-house service will be posted tomorrow by noon on our Facebook page and it will also be available on our website. Due to social distancing guidelines, limited spots are available. There's small or fun to be had on Civic Day. Stop in at our drive through on Saturday, August 1st in front of the church parking lot between 1 to 2 p.m. to pick up your free s'more summer kit. Quantities are limited, so be sure to email Pastor Betty at betty at faithwellin.com or call the church office at 905-735-6811 to place your order. Information about how you can continue to give during this season will be posted on our Facebook page later this afternoon following the service. Thank you for your faithful giving. My name is Jessica and I'm currently serving in Southeast Asia with Woban International. We are an organization that is devoted to breaking the cycle of human trafficking here in Southeast Asia by providing care, safe housing and safe work opportunities for girls who have been impacted by trauma, abuse, and exploitation. Each of our girls are cared for through counseling and discipleship programs, where we help them to find self-worth, gain an education, and receive job training. Our goal is to transform stories of hopelessness and desperation into those of hope and redemption. One of the ways that we do this is by creating small businesses that empower those who seek to provide for themselves and for their families. At this vision, we have created a vocational training school, a cafe, a jewelry and beauty business, and an organic farm. My role with Woven is to use my previous education and experience in fashion business to help with the inspiration, design, and production of jewelry. So one of the greatest parts of our ministry is that oftentimes the girls who graduate our safe home program choose to join our team. They become the ones who go out and provide prevention, awareness, and education on human trafficking to the villages nearby. And they also provide the outreach by going into the brothels and sharing the love of Jesus to the girls who are still in the darkness that they themselves were once in. Our girls are driven, determined, and passionate to share the light everywhere they go. Even in these past few months of this crazy COVID-19 season, we have seen God doing some really amazing things here. Um, for example, our jewelry sales mostly come from the tourists that are passing through. So obviously we saw a decline in sales, which meant there was no work for the girls and no income for them. However, God knew what was gonna happen and he already had a solution to our problem. So just before COVID hit, we had a donor give us 10,000 US dollars so that we can make high quality reusable fabric masks. These masks were to be distributed to people that are poor and can't afford good quality masks, and also to those who are still in exploitive situations. So we began this project um, in a season where we thought that we wouldn't be doing much. Um, you know, it kind of seemed like the world was almost paused at this time, but God gave us something to do, which was so great. So it was such a special project. First of all, it gave the girls an income Throughout all of lockdown, and even now, it's provided for us um, as our jewelry sales haven't picked up yet. So it's given the girls an income. It's provided them with a project they haven't done before. So they've all been able to learn sewing as a new skill. It's also a project that they also get to work on all together since they're not back in school yet, um, which has just been a really big blessing. Um, and it's also been a way that they can give back to their community. On top of that, it's also provided our outreach team with a way to continue to maintain relationships with the women in the brothels by going and giving out masks to them. 
So yeah, I thought that I was coming here to help out with the jewelry making, but God already knew that I was coming here to help coordinate this mask project. Um, yeah, he's just so faithful and so good. And I just want to say thank you so much for your support and for your prayers. I am just so grateful for this partnership and then I'm, I'm just so grateful that I'm able to just be here serving in this beautiful country and just meeting such amazing people. So thank you so much and be blessed. Amen. That was good to hear that report. You know, we're worshiping the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, he was, Mary was told, called him Jesus because he will save from sins. And um, now we're, we're doing uh, a series on doors for this summer, and today is the door of salvation. You can take your Bibles, it's only a couple of pages in, Genesis 6, 7, and 8. Those chapters are going to try to scream through those all on one story. Um, the account of Noah and the ark. Um, thank you for joining us here, for those that have gathered and for putting up with wearing a mask and restrictions and stuff. That, it's perseverance. I mean, there, we talk, we sing about, we've sang, I mean, I remember you put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Um, we put on a mask and we've, <laughs> we've got to put on the garment of praise through the spirit of heaviness as we put it on. But... Uh, it is a sacrifice of praise for some of you, and, and for some of you that join us online. It's, there's a lot of things you could be doing, but you've chosen today to worship with us, and I, we do appreciate that for everything you're doing, and um, hopefully we'll be rid of all of these, uh, or at least a great deal of these hindrances, and, uh, but in the meantime, it means a lot, and I just want to recognize um, the effort that so many of them are doing behind the scenes, and for you, the effort that you're making to be able to worship together today. Uh, we, um, and through this door series, we've been going through some trivia. Uh, the trivia today question is, how many doors are in the church office? You may not know, but the church office is in the house that used to be the house where the pastor lives. It's just, just uh, beside the church, and uh, it's where the offices are. What uh, maybe, I don't know if you've had a chance to be in there, not recently. We're trying to restrict. It's a very small house. But uh, see if you can guess how many doors are in the church office. Okay, see how close you are. Now, this is not even counting. I was going to begin to try to count the cabinet doors and the cupboard doors, but this is not that. There's just doors, and it's kind of tricky because there's a couple of secret doors. 21 doors in that little house, concluding uh, that is closets, office doors, enter and exit doors, and two little secret doors. Some staff members may not even know about those doors. Um, we're today looking at the door of salvation specifically, and I'll get to a little bit more in a moment, but the door that was the door on the ark. It was open for a long time, and then at one point, critical point, it was closed. Almost everybody in the world uh, has heard about the great flood and Noah's ark. If you showed a picture of it, they would be, they would be able to identify it. There's a place down in, in Kentucky where you can go and see a life-size uh, and walk through a life-size ark. It's a, we would like to go there at some point as a family, and many people that have went said it's a powerful moment. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from Noah's Ark. There's a lot of stories about Noah's Ark. I remember having Noah's Ark pictures in the kids' bedrooms when they were young. And, and I remember having the, the uh, mobiles from the ceiling with all the little animals. It's a story we've told children at a young age. Uh, but, but maybe there is something new we can draw from God's Word today. There's a wise individual that came out with some pretty interesting um, wisdom from Noah's Ark. I'm going to share a few with him today. Maybe just this will speak to you. He said this, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built an ark. That's a good one. How about this one? Don't listen to critics. 
just get on with what has to be done. Here's another real good one. This is starting to get practical. Speed isn't always an advantage. Snails were on board with cheetahs. I think that's a, that's a good one. Here's another very, very wise one. Woodpeckers inside are a larger threat than the storm outside. That's a very good one. Here's another one. Stay fit. When you're 600 years old, someone might ask you to do something that's really big. Uh, and, and finally, I think this is probably the best advice. Do not, do not miss the boat. Now what do we know about, well here's what we know. We know that, that the ark that Noah built was a real boat. And it took 120 years to build. It's probably one of the, it was at the time, the most famous building in the world. I mean, it was the Big Ben, the Eiffel Tower, the Empire State Building, and the Kremlin, and the CN Tower all built in together. It would be a sight. The materials, we know the materials as well. Gopher wood, now that doesn't sound very impressive, but it is a cypress wood that is basically indestructible and does not rot. For those people who are wood, you understand that if you're going to build something, it's going to be a little bit in the wet area or a deck. Oftentimes you'll build it out of cedar here. This wood would not rot and it was a very, very hard wood. We know that it also had a pitch or it, uh, the word that is used means covering like a tar because the wood in of itself wouldn't keep the rain out and they were to build a roof and and on the roof and are on the wood they are supposed to cover it with a pitch now just as a side note this might be just one for you maybe you have heard this before maybe not but the word used for the pitch or the covering is the same word that's used 70 times in the old testament for atonement now isn't that interesting I mean, that which would cover the ark to protect it, to make it a place of safety from the threat that was coming, was called a covering, a pitch, an atonement. Size, 450 feet long. That is a long, long boat. Imagine trying to dock that boat. 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Its shape, well, wasn't, was definitely not built for speed. <laughs> this would be more like the shape of the, one of those pontoon boats. Actually, it's more like a floating coffin, if you were to look at the shape of it. Not very fitting when you'd be entering into it, would it be? Uh, the structure, one door, one window, three stories. Okay, so that's the boat. So, what was the world like at the time? Well, sin was destroying everything that was good and all the good that God created. Noah was the, see if I can get this right, the great, 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 great grandson of Adam and Eve. Some of you can check that, that's six of them, I believe I got it right. Now that sounds like a lot of greats, but if you figure it just even when you're going through the Bible, you see Genesis 1, God created the heaven and the earth, everything, and it was all good. And we just get to Genesis 6, and all of a sudden everything has just gone down the tubes. What has happened? Well, remember, not too long ago we discussed Cain, the violence. Well, that violence has spread. It was not just one brother against his, his brother who did what was right, it was now a whole nation, and, and the whole world had, had been overcome with violence. Genesis chapter 6 and 5, and, and then again in verse 11 and 20, it says that God looked on the world, and it was corrupt, and it was full of violence. I wonder what God would see if he looked at our world today. What would, what would be the few words that would describe our world today? Huh? What do you see? Open up a paper, pull up a live feed, just to see what comes up in Apple News morning after morning. It says that every desire within humanity drew them away 
from God with evil thoughts and deeds. They had abandoned God completely. I'm going to have an opportunity for you to discuss just for a few seconds. I want you to reflect on some present day examples of choices that ruin lives. People were, people were making bad choices. And, and God looked and, and over the world and this is what he saw. So he decided to deal with the sin. Now, it was a, they were sinning for a long time and going this way for a long, long time. Can I just say here, and maybe this isn't a popular thing to say, but it is truth capitalized, underlined, and highlighted. Sin eventually leads to death. There are consequences to sin. It may not be immediate, but the books are always balanced. Now, Noah was a man who listened to God, and because he listened to God, God revealed the plan to him. Some good news and some bad news. Now, the bad news first. God was going to send consequences to the earth. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve could eat from and, and enjoy the garden and had complete freedom with one exception. There was one tree, and from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they should not eat its fruit. Now, how many know? I mean, you want to test the kid's will. You just tell them what they can't do. In fact, I believe this is a big reason why we have such a big problem with things like this. Because we don't like to be told what we can't do. I mean, there's one thing to tell someone what they need to do, but you want to get resistance, you tell someone something they can't do. We do not like that. Joy this whole garden, Adam and Eve. It's all yours. Just don't eat. And where does the enemy attack? I'll tell you where the enemy attacks. He attacks in the one area where they're told they, they must not. The, God tells them, do not eat from this tree. Then, however, a, through a serpent, the enemy of God comes to them and tells them God was lying. That they, if they ate from the tree, they would not die. In fact, they would become like God. They would live. Adam and Eve listened to the enemy of God rather than God. And at that moment, Genesis 3, 7 describes everything changed. Can I just say this? Sin always destroys. Sin spoils. Nine generations later, the world was in terrible shape. Here's the good news. God had a rescue plan for the world, and it would have one door. The rescue plan would require Noah to follow some very specific instructions of how to build an ark. He told him exactly how big it would be, what type of wood, how to cover it. He told him to bring some food. It's going to be a trip. How many, when you go on family trips, you don't rely on stopping at restaurants you pack some sandwiches and some snacks, right? We pick it up on verse 14 of Genesis 6. Make a roof for it, God says. Lead the sides of the ark open a foot and a half from the top. That's not a lot of space. Put a door in one side of the ark. Make lower, middle, and upper decks. God told Noah to make one door. One door. All the people that would be safe from the coming flood would have to go, and every living thing, if it was going to be safe, 
would need to go through that one door. It was the door of salvation. The ark was not Noah's idea. God did not tell him, a flood's coming, see what you can do with that information. It was God's idea. And and this ark would provide Noah and his family and all living creatures that would enter into that door safety, sanctuary. It was the only place to be safe. Listen to this promise in verse 18 to 21. I will make a covenant with you, God says to Moses. You will enter the ark, your sons and your wife and your sons' wives will enter it with you. Bring two of every living thing into the ark. Bring male, female of them into it. And they will be kept alive with you. All of them will be kept alive with you. Noah means rest. When Noah walked into that ark, and all living things that entered that ark, they would enter into rest. Why? Why was Noah given salvation? Well, we can focus on the fact that it says Noah was a righteous man, blameless among all the people at his time. But that really wasn't it. That was a a true description of who he is. But it makes you think that he was perfect, but that wasn't it. A very important word, the most important word that we need to understand today. It says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was living right, and yeah, it's true. I mean, the problem is, is Noah was not perfect. We know that because if you follow his story and you don't have to follow it very long to see that he made some huge, huge mistakes that affected people's lives around him, people that, that would be close to him. But he did live and do what was right in a world that was going the opposite direction. Can I say, God is looking for people who will stand up in a world controlled by sin, stand up in a world that's going the opposite way, and reflect his love and his power. And by that, I do not mean stand up and pick your battles. I really feel like the church should pick its battles. We start battling about things of whether we should or shouldn't wear mace. We All these rules and guidelines we're fighting over, let's pick our battles. Let's stand out for how we stand out that we we show ourselves to be people that are full of grace and mercy, that, that represent our God well. Too often, we are identified as people who are critical and attacking when that is not the way our Savior walked. Love, compassion, serving, willing to wash others' feet, humbling themselves. God is looking up looking for a people in a world that is living for itself and that will live according to a higher purpose. I mean, anybody can follow the crowd, but not everybody follows Christ. Maybe God is asking you to follow him. I'm not sure. Maybe you're the only one. Maybe you're the only one at work. Maybe you're the only one that, that wants to follow Christ at, in your family. Maybe, maybe you're the only one in your community. Maybe the only one in your, fr- in your circle of friends. Maybe the only one in your class. I'm not sure. Maybe the only one. Noah was literally the only one. But he obeyed, followed God, and received God's grace. See, we can read that he was blameless, that he was righteous, he did what was right, but the problem is, we think that he was perfect, he was not. Like you and I, he, fall, he fell short of the glory of God and he himself needed grace. Grace is the word that made the difference in Noah's life. It all comes down to pure, precious, perfect grace. Dave, Pastor Dave talked last week about grace and mercy. Grace being getting what you do not deserve and mercy being not getting what you do deserve. They work in great tandem to one another. Too many people are talking about my rights. I want to get what I deserve. And I really don't think they really understand what they do deserve. Let me ask you this. This is a great chance to stop here and pause and and discuss, maybe a little bit reflect. Discuss or reflect on the fact, what does God's grace mean to you? How has God shown you grace?
Amen. Amazing grace. So Noah walked in a way that was right, had grace from God, and, and, and walked in the way that was, what, what was the key to him walking so straight in such a crooked world? We get some insight, I believe, in the second part of Genesis 6 and 9. Because it says that he walked with God. You want to walk straight at work when you're the only one who seems like is, is following in the way of God or, or at school or at home or in your family. The key to walking straight in the world is walking with God. That's the key. What does it mean to walk with God? Well, let's flip back again to his great, 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 great grandma and grandpa. Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, it says it just wasn't, they weren't just there, but they were there walking with God in the cool of the day, Genesis says. Imagine what it would be like, walking with the Creator. What would we talk about? What would we hear? What would we say? In our world today, it just doesn't mean just literally walking. I mean, we think of those people that walked with Jesus and part and followed him for the three and a half years of his ministry on this earth as his disciples. But it's not just being in the same presence, touching or holding hands. It means to be, to be aware, to walk with the recognition that they are there, and to interact and encounter. It's, it's talking, it's listening. When we were worshiping just a few minutes ago, and before you we will leave, you'll have another opportunity to realize that the Almighty God, the creator of heavens and earth, is, is, is here. Here for you to speak to, to share, to open your heart to, and to hear from. The one who knows all is here. When we, we don't need to, to take a certain posture, I love the fact that it was just walking in the cool of the day. It's not just walking, it's listening as well. Noah obviously listened to God. And God promises a great blessing to those. There's a number of scriptures that will say that through the word, that, that it is those who follow in God's way will be blessed. I'm not saying just financially and immediately, but there is a blessing that comes to following God. He's guiding us in the way that's right. So Moses, uh, Noah, I knew I was going to say Moses. I did this about three times when I was talking about my message today. If I say Moses again, it's not Moses. I'm not referring to Moses at all during this sermon. It is actually Noah. So Noah was doing what was right. He was walking with God. And the key to walking with God in a crooked world, doing what was right, is walking and listening and obeying God. Before the flood came, God sent an invitation and to enter into safety. Flipping now over to Genesis chapter 7. Who would enter in this door of salvation? Well, Noah, his family, and animals. Now, 2 Peter 2 and 2 talks about Noah. There's a few references in the New Testament about Noah. And it says that Noah preached righteousness. Or Noah not only lived right, but attempted to communicate that there's a right way to live with those around him that were living in a crooked way. Today, we would seriously be checking out Noah's credentials. Because the guy ministered for 120 years and got not one single convert other than his own family. I mean, it's the pastor growing the church by just having his family come, taking attendance. Who would like to serve today? All of us, just the family. Who's on the worship team? Pastor's family. 120 years. I mean, most preachers today would throw in the towel maybe after the first decade, definitely after the first century. Maybe, maybe I need to take a break from ministry would probably be what... A preacher would say today. What's also interesting is during that whole time, the door would remain open. The door of safety. It's also interesting to note that when disaster is about to come, throughout God's word, he often and almost always sends a warning. It's what the prophets did over and over again. A warning. 
if you do not turn from your ways, there is coming consequences. A, a place like Nineveh, Jonah went to, and he didn't want to go because they were really, really bad people. God sent them a warning. Why didn't God just destroy all the people? Why wait 120 years if after 120 years not one of them would, would repent? Why not just figure out a way to just save Noah and the animals? Why go through all of this? Well, 2 Peter also gives us a little bit of insight. In chapter 3, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He's not slow in the way some people understand it. He is patient. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. Instead, he wants all people to turn away from their sins. He's patient. He's merciful. He's compassionate. Okay. So, Noah and his family would accept an invitation, the animals, and they would go and they would, be, they would receive their second chance. Noah listened and obeyed God. Now, this is very important. Not only did he listen to him in the 120 years and everyone was going crooked, the problem is God just, just didn't send a warning and that's all that needed to happen. Someone had to hear the warning and heed the warning. God just didn't scoop them up and throw them kapow into the ark. He said, now's the time to get in the ark. And because Noah had established a pattern of hearing and obeying God, God said, hey Noah, it's time to build an ark. And what did he do? He built it. And then God said, hey Noah, it's time to get in the ark. What, God, what did Noah do? He got in the ark. Noah did everything just as God commanded him, it said in verse 22. This is what it means to have faith and trust God. Faith comes by hearing, but also, by listening, but also by doing. Think about it, it never even rained before. This escape plan was based on two things. Number one, God's plan. Number two, Noah's obedience. This is true for salvation today. There is a way of salvation today, but make no mistake, and some might even emphasize the fact that they didn't do anything, they didn't respond at all, but that is not the case. You must respond with obedience and action to the invitation of salvation. There must be a response. Before the end of this message, I'm going to give a response today for all in the building and for all online. You must respond by entering into salvation. Very important for us to listen to God God may be asking you to do something, go somewhere, be kind to somebody, extend an invitation of life, offer to pray for someone. It's very, very important to establish a pattern of listening and obeying God because at some point, it will be critical. Your obedience will be a matter of life and death. Blessed are those who hear God's word and obey it. So when it came time for the floods, God shut the door. This might be a new one for some of you. But it's very important to see it. That ark must have been an unusual sight in ancient Mesopotamia. I mean, think about it. I'm, I'm sure they, we were talking about this in our small group the other day. I'm sure there must have been some paths that started to get worn. Uh, where if there was not a road to the ark, there was one eventually where people would come by just to see it. As it getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it became quite a sight, I'm sure. And, 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 and the focus of, I'm absolutely sure of a lot of conversations as time went on. A wooden box 450 feet long, 75 feet wide and 45 feet high, now covered with pitch, one door. Surely they thought Noah was mad and a bad dad for making his kids help him build it. Finally the day came, a seven day notice. Rain's coming, get in. And after Noah and his family and the animals were in the ark safely, God shut the door. In verse 16 of Genesis 7, it says, God shut them in. The Lord himself threw the lock. There was no, I mean, have you ever had this? You're in bed and, and uh, you're just about to fall asleep and your spouse says, Honey, did you remember to lock the front door? You ever have one of those? And you know that no peace is coming that evening until you get up and check the lock. All eight persons 
knew they were perfectly safe. God shut the door. Now, this becomes a really point, and this is a very important part of the message. A closed door can be a great blessing. This is for someone today. Watching online or here today, this is for someone today. Sometimes a closed door is a good thing. Because you see, all of a sudden, after the door would close, the clouds would gather, the rain would descend, the waters would rise. Think about it. How God opens and closes doors in our life. Now, open doors are extremely gratifying and walking through them, it almost seems natural. Whether a promotion at work or a proposal, a proposal of marriage, a, a trip, an opportunity, they all seem so exciting. It, it, this must be God blessing me with an open door. It's easy to put an equal sign between open door and blessing. What about the blessing of a closed door? Relations 3, 7 says, God opens doors no one can shut, and shuts doors no one else can open. God opens doors, and God shuts doors. A lost job, a broken leg, a serious illness, rejection of employment, death of a loved one, endings, closings. How can they be a blessing? whether temporary or permanently. And when a door closes in front of us, we are often left discombobulated and discouraged. We understand that if God opens or closes a door, he does it for our own good. And if he does it for our own good, that closed door is a blessing, whether we see it or not at the time. Maybe the closed door is not a no, but I have something better for you. Here's a good chance, one last chance to discuss before we uh, close the message off. Reflect or share of a time when a closed door for you was a huge blessing. I remember when uh, our kids were young. We realized really quick when we had to uh, kid-proof the house. You know what I'm talking about? We had to do something with the doors. Because they could end up on the front street. They could end up getting into the cupboards that had things that, that if they drank or ate would, would cause them to be sick. What did we have to do? Well, I was too cheap to buy those expensive door guards. Uh, I figured out ways elastics, uh, zip ties, or whatever you had to do. But somehow you had to make sure the doors were shut and stayed shut for your kids' own good. True? Why would not our Heavenly Father shut a door and make sure that door is shut? Because He knows better than we know that His children should not go through that door. That door is a blessing. I want to share an illustration. I got permission to share this today. Back the first of the year, I remember going down to the Penn Center and, and having, uh, going to the place of my favorite place to get a crepe, Monsieur Crepes, uh, by Masha and Andre. I would uh, order a crepe for lunch and visit a little bit. While I was there, Andre said, Pastor, pray for me. And pray for us. The lease on our store is coming up for renewal, and we are in the middle of discussions. I prayed with him, and I shared with him the verse I just did a few moments ago, Revelation 3. God opens doors no one can shut, and shuts doors no one else can open. If God wants them to be there, he will make a way for that lease to be renewed that is affordable for them. Well, a couple weeks later, Pam and I went down and uh, together and got a crepe together. They make a Nutella crepe, Nutella and banana. It's very good. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying, I know it's a little bit of a, if you have a treat crepe, that's a treat crepe. 
cheat day is. Uh, but we went down there, and while we were there, Andre said, Pastor, it seems like God is closing the door. Discussions are broken down. Uh, we are not going to be able to renew our lease here. And he was, he was discouraged a little bit. They had been six years, almost, I, I guess, where they had been uh, poured their life into this business. In the middle of March, they messaged the prayer team, and the, the, the email went around to the prayer team to pray for them as it was their last week. But they said that they had a peace about it. They felt like it was God shutting the door. And what's interesting is that very shortly after, they closed their doors because their lease was not renewed. All of the Penn Center was closed because of COVID-19. And all the businesses and all the restaurants and stores that were in the Penn Center would have to pay their lease, even though they weren't able to generate any business. But not Andre and Masha, because the door was already closed by God, literally just days before the Penn Center would close down. It was a huge blessing. Pam and I would reflect on that more than once, say, man, God really looked after Masha and Andre by shutting them. They would, it would be thousands and thousands of dollars that they have to pay in rent. It's just an unbelievable number, what they saved. Now God is opening up new doors for them. The money they saved, they bought a van. That van they've now used to be able to go to local markets and be able to generate some income. You might see them. I think they're in the St. Catherine's Market on Thursdays. I called Masha and Andre this week to rejoice with them. We finished our time with prayer. And in that prayer, after I asked permission, and it was after the prayer I asked for permission to share it, in that prayer I thanked God for a closed door. That was a blessing. And I thank God for opening doors for them. The Bible has open and closed doors, and the closed doors we don't often focus on. In Sodom, Lot was standing outside trying to reason with some wicked people that were wanting to do some wicked things. And as he was trying to reason with them, messengers from heaven came, grabbed him, pulled him inside, and closed the door to save him and his daughters from danger. Rahab and Jericho, her family went into the house, closed the door. While the rest of Jericho would be destroyed, they would be safe. In Jerusalem, the prophet Isaiah was God's spokesman. And he was speaking to a few people left in Judah who were walking in the way that was right. When Assyria was coming and attacking them, listen to this. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the door behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until wrath has passed. Oh, that we would get to the point we recognize. And it's difficult, a little bit counterintuitive. A closed door is a blessing. Okay, I'm going to try to move quickly now and get to the end response. As promised, the rain fell and the whole earth was flooded. Sky turned black. Lightning flashed. It says rain fell 40 days and 40 nights. Now, there's some important numbers here. We know 40 days and 40 nights. That's just how long it rained. That's not how long they were on the ark. It came down like Niagara Falls, and it didn't stop morning or night. The whole thing was flooded. It, the rivers rise so high that the Bible says the water was 20 feet over the top of the mountains. Inside the ark, I'm sure there was a praise and thanksgiving service more than once. Now, the trip was probably rough. Maybe a few people got seasick. A few animals might have got seasick. I mean, not everybody's meant to float on a boat for that long. It says everything was destroyed on the earth. Only Noah and those who were with them in the ark were saved. And the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. That's a long time. If you look a little farther, it takes a long time for the water then to get down the point where they can get off the ark. It was over a year. It was 40 days that it rained, 150 days for the water to start to recede. And it was not until a year later that Noah and his family would leave the ark. After the water subsided, God invited Noah and his family to come out into a new world. Chapter 8. The earth had been washed have been cleansed. 
It was now brand new. Life all around them. Bring out every kind of living thing, God says in his word, that is with you. Bring the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground. Then they can multiply in the earth and they can have little ones and increase in their numbers. Fresh start. Even though people's hearts were always directed toward evil, God instructs through an image of a rainbow and says, I will never, never do this again. Even though I know people's hearts are towards evil. I'm going to have the worship team come up. We're getting ready to close the service, but before we do, we're going to have a chance to be able to respond. I want to give you just one final thought. God shut the door of the ark. At that moment, there were two people in the world. People who had walked through the door of salvation and those who had not. There were those inside at safety looking out, and there were those outside safety looking on. There was two people. Those who had heeded the warnings and those who who had rejected them. One ark, one door. It says that Jesus Christ is the door. He says of himself in John chapter 10, I am the door. So this is just a simple question. What side of the door are you on today? God loves people and wants to rescue them. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but make no mistake that you cannot live away from God, against God, reject Him and disobey Him and expect to be saved. This is not meant to be a heavy. This is strictly meant to be an opportunity for you to make a decision. If you decide to reject God, that is your choice. But you cannot expect safety. You cannot expect salvation. John 10 says, I am the door, but also says, anyone who goes in through me will be saved from the punishment of sin. It's the message of John. It's the message of Noah. There is one door, one way to salvation, but anybody who enters into that enters into safety. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again to cancel the power of sin and death. Yes, The consequences of sin is death. But through Christ, all who would come through that door come into a new life, a fresh start, a second chance. Anyone who believes in Christ is a new creation. Old is gone, new is come. The door is open today. you and I are going to be saved then we have to commit to accepting his invitation and enter into the safety that's provided it's important to listen to God if the Holy Spirit speaking to you today you need to respond today is he calling you into the ark of safety right now we are in that seven day period I believe those moments where the invitation is to come, enter into safety, enter in now. The door is open, and this is a difficult thing to be able to share, but it is truth and I need to share it. The door does not remain open forever. The door will close. I wanna close today by praying a prayer of salvation if you're here in the room or if you're watching online. If you want to enter into the door of salvation today, I simply going to, for those who are here, have you stand. If you're watching online, then I'm going to have you just type the word stand. In a few moments, we're all going to join and stand together as we, we talk to God. But if you're here today and you want to enter into the salvation that's provided for you through Jesus Christ, would you stand? online if you want to enter into that salvation maybe you have you have strayed like the people in Noah's day you have disobeyed but you're hearing the warning today from God's word and you would like to enter you would like to return 
the door is open. Would you stand? Just type stand. I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. Lead you in a prayer. Let's pray. Would you join me if you've stood? Or today, if you want to invite God to be your Lord and Savior, if you're willing to obey and take him up on his invitation of life, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I admit to going my own way. I admit to going the wrong way. I admit to, to, to be ignoring in my relationship with you, to not listening or obeying. I need a rescue. I need your grace. I need your mercy and forgiveness. And I ask for it now. Thank you for the gift of salvation that you extend to me through Jesus. I accept it and the new life that it gives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, everyone? The team is going to lead us in the song. We've already sung a one, God a Revival. But as we sing it, I invite you. If you're here and if you can't sing, but you can pray and talk to God, I invite you to spend some time just talking with him and listening to him. Hear what his spirit's saying to you. And in the middle, there's going to be a moment of, of instrumental where the team is just going to play. At that time, I invite all online and all on site to join in a cry of salvation. By that I mean, you pray for your spouses, you pray for your kids, you pray for your families, you pray for your community, you pray for your work, you pray for your boss, you pray for this country, but we will rise a prayer of salvation, a cry of salvation. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, I will heal their land. So as we sing, spend some time talking to God. When the time instrument come, I'm going to invite you to join me in a cry of salvation.
closing and you know there are those individuals you love, you care for. Heavenly Father, we pray today, reach out your hand of salvation. Send people that would extend invitation to come. People that be obedient to the Spirit's leading. To those loved ones who have, have strayed a long ways. Lord, I pray that you would lay before them an opportunity to come to their senses. That God, you would bring a returning. Join with me in praying for your families, for your loved ones, for your friends, for this community, the areas in this community that have been darkened by sin. We can see the consequences of it, the pain that it causes a trend towards a way that is violent and corrupt. Jesus. Lord, I pray you would turn the tide. Send us, Lord. May we show the compassion and the grace and the mercy of our God. Speak truth and wisdom in all situations. Be ready to be able to give a reason for the hope that we have. Bring revival, Lord. Start it with us. Especially in the situations that seem impossible. The ones we've been praying for for a long time. I'm thankful for the God stories we've heard over the last year. Some who have been going the wrong direction for a while, but you have reached them. They're walking with you today because you're still a God who is patient and compassionate, not wishing for anyone to perish. We pray for some of those impossible cases, some of those situations that seem like never, ever will an individual turn back to you, especially those ones that seem to be going in the wrong direction. Lord, I pray like Manasseh in the Old Testament, who spent his whole life running opposite direction of you in one moment he cried out to you and you had compassion on him Lord I pray that you would do an impossible work of salvation today in Jesus name in Jesus name salvation, bring revival. Got it. 
increase the urgency in our heart and our mind that we would grow in an urgency to share not to be harsh not to be condescending but to be inviting to extend the invitation for new life and a second chance to be gracious to be merciful and compassionate the way that you are and patient for those that have been praying for loved ones give us the patience give us the patience but increase the urgency as we leave this building as we turn off online open our eyes for open doors of salvation open doors for us to share faith and life online. I'm going to have the people here that are with us on site. You can be seated. God bless you as you go.